Bonjour, Annie Noche, Marc de Bene Indigene Cars, and Squatters and Dondem. My given name uh, is Cheyenne Havorka, uh, now Cheyenne Bartlett through marriage. Um, and I am currently a member of the Red Rock Indian Band, uh, formerly a member of Metachuan First Nation. I am an Ojibwe teacher with the Superior Greenstone District School Board, working at George O'Neill Public School. We're working on a translation project with Nelson Education. Um, as an Ojibwe teacher, I often find that we, there are s s numerous great r resources out there. Uh, however, they're often in a dialect that's not conducive with the, the local dialect in the community, or they're not comprehensive. There's only like one or two uh, resources within there that we could use, um, and they jump from level to level. Uh, and I, I've always dreamed as a teacher to have a resource that was comprehensive from a beginning language learner all the way to an emergent language learner beyond. Um, and uh, we had received the Circle of Life series from Nelson, uh, which were all in English. Uh, and the Circle of Life series is based on Indigenous culture, traditions, and heritage from Ontario, taken from... Uh, Nelson worked with elders from across Ontario to make sure that it was accurate information, that they were representing Indigenous um, cultures, traditions, and heritage of Ontario in, in a respectful and proper way. And I read through all the books, and they're wonderful books. Um, as an Ojibwe teacher, though, they weren't uh, really conducive with my programming. They were great for guided reading in the uh, core subjects, uh, which was great to infuse Indigenous learning within the primary sector of the school. But I thought, like, okay, well, maybe there's a chance that we could get these translated into our local dialect, because currently we have no resources unless they're self-created um, for use in our schools and in the local dialect. So I contacted Nelson and asked them if it was a possibility to completely translate the Circle of Life series into our current Ojibwe dialect uh, from Red Rock Indian Band, um, Lake Helen First Nation. Um, and uh, they went through their paperwork and re we established that yes, it was a possibility and I just needed to go out and find some funding. So with the help of the Ontario Arts Council, I was able to receive funding and now we have funding to translate all 56 books from a level A to a level U reading. So that's like from pre-beginning reading all the way up to uh, emergent reading, past emergent reading actually. Uh, and on top of that, we also received funding to do audio recordings so that the people who are reading the book or teachers who are using the resources they might not be able to pronounce the words properly and that we see that a lot so there'll be an audio recording to go along with each book and we are also creating soundscape music in the background just to add a little bit more life into the the audio as you're listening to it when you're going through the content of the books it is it's very open to all ages so i think even like as an adult you could go through the series and be learning culture heritage and tradition while learning the language as um, and not being the kid and not being bored with these books because they're it's it's not like the C spot run books right my target area personally is for the younger um, people however our school board is already um, considering buying the entire series for all the high schools as well because a lot of the language programs there are starting right from ground zero with a lot of the students that are in the program so these could be used as listening centers uh, and also there are some communities that are interested in bringing it into their communities so that they can offer uh, different resources to their members to assist in trying to revitalize the language. Our aim is for, to revitalize the language uh, and also to create a comprehensive resource for the native language programs within this area. When I started it, I wasn't thinking of like, I'm going to do something excellent here. Um, I think my, my initial idea was to create something that my students could use and something that would assist me in, in giving my students uh, a real authentic program that was meaningful to them in the language of their community. So that was, that was my idea. And I think as a teacher, when you're understanding what excellence is in a classroom, it's understanding 
your students and uh, especially from the language perspective, understanding the, the dialect within that region, respecting it, um, and being able to connect with the elders in the community to ensure that what you're teaching is what's in their community. Because um, technically, uh, native language, it can be any language or dialect taught in a school as long as it's a native language. So I could be teaching Cree and it's still a native language. Uh, however, I really wanted to offer my students their language. Um, and people who know and understand the language know that the language um, is connected to their community, uh, which is part of the reason why there's so many dialects. So it just gives the students um, a more authentic learning experience and I think it's more respectful as well. Um, and in line with that, again, not be, not saying that it's excellence, but I think that it brings it up to that a different level. Um, when we're talking about the TRC recommendations um, and we're looking and also looking at uh, trauma, past trauma um, in education, like with, with the the comfortability of Indigenous people in education. I think uh, building community trust and relationships really helps kids feel good in the school, really helps community members feel good about education, and also helps the teachers feel more connected within the community itself. So this project is also connecting all of these different people and bringing um, valued relationships out and so I don't think it's what I'm doing that makes it excellent. I think what makes it excellent is that we're building a trust and a relationship within the community between the school, the school board, the principal, the teachers, the students, the parents, and the community members. We're already seeing, even though it's, it's going to be a while before they're in the school, um, we are seeing success already um, as other education facilities outside of this area are already waiting for the series to come out. Uh, I believe because it's, it is a comprehensive series, it is built on a, um, uh, an actual guided reading series that is um, well known and respected in the education, what's the word I'm looking for, environment. So um, now we can't drop it because there are other school boards within Northern Ontario that are looking, waiting for this to come out. So I think on an education level, that, that's already showing the level of success in there. Um, and Nelson had said that they're probably going to use how we're doing it as a model to do this with other uh, Indigenous languages within the province. So I think that shows success. Um, I think the other success measure that I'm seeing, even though they're not done yet, is that community connection between the school and the community itself is getting stronger. Um, the people in the community are excited about the project. They're excited that it's their language in these books uh, and that these books are, are they're very well done. They're very professionally done. They're like a very reputable company and, and you know, their language and their thoughts are in it. Next week is Orange Shirt Day, and all educators are asked to talk about Orange Shirt Day. So we can bring that to our students, and we can teach them about residential schools, and we can teach them why every child matters. Uh, we can teach them about the stories of Phyllis, Phyllis Webstat and, and uh, Cheney Wenjack and uh, all the other thousands of stories. Um, we can also teach them land-based living. Uh, we can teach them the language. We can um, tell them the stories of the pre-colonization and the, when the connections happened. Um, we can talk to them about, I talk to my students quite a bit about music, um, indigenous music, not just hand drums and, and powwows, but also the other artists. That, and I'm a little bit biased because I am a musician but uh, how contemporary music also tells stories in, uh, from the Indigenous perspective. Um, but I think what real Indigenous education is, is that when the teacher 
themselves is getting connected to what they want to bring to the students and really feeling understanding um, what it means to know that piece of information and how it's connected to other pieces of information. Um, and I think also, as far as the schools can turn, Indigenous education, you know, we, we really do have to be aware that, you know, there's local and there's more a bigger community and then there's nation and that those are three different levels um, and they are very different from each other from local to local and so the teachers need to really understand their local indigenous histories cultures traditions and be sure that that's embedded in their teaching um, and being careful not to paintbrush things or check off like yes I've talked about treaty days yes I've talked about orange shirt day yes I've talked about powwows and yes I've talked about residential schools so to be able to see the connections and where it fits within within um, within our communities well I know with our school board right now we're putting a big focus on bringing the Indigenous education at a real level, a hands-on level, an embedded level, especially with the, the, the really young ones, uh, starting with the early years. Like some schools have daycare, such as my school, and bringing it into the kindergarten room. Um, and not just having what we sometimes refer to as the token activity, um, but have it like as a, a regular center um, where it's not necessarily always indigenous, it could be other cultures that we're putting in there. Um, so for us, you know, we'll have like a listening center and we'll, we'll put on um, some powwow music or we'll put on uh, appro age appropriate um, storytelling um, or like I'll go in with my Ojibwe classes and work with the little kids. So we mix them up a little bit and then they'll teach them little animal names and play puppet games. but. Um, just so that they're starting to hear it and, and be exposed to it on a regular basis. And I think as far as Indigenous education is concerned, that's what it really needs to be. It needs to be an embedded part so it feels, not just feels, so it is um, part of who we are as a community um, and that it's not this, today we're learning about Indigenous, well, indigenous we're on indigenous land you know we are all somehow affiliated and affected um and and we are all together indigenous on, on some level right so when you have these kids that are non-indigenous and they're learning indigenous as a separate entity and not even realizing like little Sally next to them is indigenous. Like they haven't made that connection um, because it's taught separately. Mm -hmm. But when it's embedded in, then it just becomes a natural part of life, right? Because yep. that's what it is. Like we're here now mm -hmm. and we're part of this environment and uh, we are coexisting as we speak. So that should be reflected in how we're, we're teaching too. Well, obviously, proper people in positions um, and I say that gently um, because I myself I'm like obviously mixed right um, so who's to say who is supposed to be in those positions however that being said I have seen um, positions filled that are indigenous related by completely non-Indigenous people who really don't know, but the positions weren't fill, filled before um, and, or nobody qualified, applied for them and the positions needed to be built. Thus you get the person in there that's uh, in the position trying to learn, like 99% 90, of the time they are working hard to understand, but school life is very busy, being a teacher is very busy and Indigenous way of knowing being and feeling is is more than just okay tomorrow I'm going to cover that 
I just need to like skim this enough to bring it to the class because you're missing that whole big connection picture. And if you're missing it, your students are going to miss it too. If we're somehow able to revamp our hiring practices um, to ensure that the people that the people teaching the languages, um, the people that are uh, teaching Indigenous studies in any grade, um, have the support of knowledgeable people. I'm not going to use the word Indigenous people. I'm going to say knowledgeable people um, to properly support that program so that it is a real authentic learning as opposed to what I've referred to as like a paintbrushed learning. Um, that's gonna take time because there's other forces that need to be changed. Uh, the other thing too that I think needs to happen is I, I find education a lot of times like Western education, I'll, I'll call it Western education, is very linear that we're going to start here and we're going to get to here. Whereas Indigenous education is very circular. It always comes back, back. It always comes back. So we sometimes have, somehow have to take, make a line and a circle fit together. So I'm thinking somehow we have to figure out how to make it a spiral, right? <laughs> so it is still circling back and there's still a point A and a point B. Um, and, but we're still coming back, right? However, that would take a whole lot of everybody being able to think differently as opposed to the very linear approach. But I do see, and in our board especially, I do see shifts in thinking, um, shifts in how we're approaching and, uh, more collaboration with community members and or with teachers that do know. And I also see that teachers are starting to take more risks in saying like, you know, I really don't know that, can you help me? Or where can I get help doing that, which is great. So you can have all the resources in the world, but at the end of the day, it's the knowledge that you need to really, really create that embeddedness that we're all hoping and looking for. I have some good hopes and that like the elders that we're working with right now that hold the language, like it's like they hold the old, like they're, they're getting up there. Like we have to get this project done because we don't want them to get sick. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, they hold that. How do I say this nicely? It's not urbanized. Like it's that old language. So if we can get that down and preserve it somehow, um, I just read an article by uh, Boyden not too long ago. I can't remember the date, but I could send you the citation if you need it um, on the statistics on how many people speak the language, how many people did speak the language, how many youth are speaking the language now. And uh, there's 16,000 speakers of Ojibwe. Now, I can't remember if it said Northern Ontario. I think it's Northern Ontario or all of Ontario. It's not a lot. And out of the youth speakers, um, they pulled 3,000. But that doesn't mean all the youth have answered. So there could have been a lot of people that didn't answer mm -hmm. that still speak the language. But looking at those bare bone numbers without knowing the unknowns, that's still less than a quarter mm -hmm. that have, oh, yeah. that are holding the language still. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I think it's, the race is on to do what we can to, to keep the language alive um, and creating ways to, to so it's not just um, the people who hold the language that are, okay, you need to get into these classrooms and you need to help hang on to this language because, you know, everybody grows older and there's only so much every, a, a person can do. Mm -hmm. So I think resources like this will at least help hang on to it a little bit longer and hopefully help in revitalizing it. Oh, and going back to resources, <laughs> the one thing that I do find ineffective, and when you look at research, it is ineffective, two things, okay. two things. Number one, starting in grade four doesn't work. Well, it does work, like it does help, right? But I think it needs to start in primary 
the actual language programs need to start. So not just me taking my kids down there once or twice a week, teaching the kindergartens a couple of words. We need to actually get the program running when they're little, when they like to sing, when they like to dance, when they and they absorb every little thing that you tell them. Um, so that's one thing that we need to bring the language programs right into primary, not starting in grade four. And that's a government thing. The government only funds grade four and up <clears throat> at the public sector anyway um, for most schools. And the second thing is at least we have core programming and at least we have the language in the schools. And that's fantastic because a few years ago, it, that wasn't, I know I didn't get the option of taking Ojibwe. I had to take French. Um, so it's great that we have any kind of programming. However, when you're dealing with languages that are at risk, you need more than core, core programming. And there's a lot of research on it that supports that the core programming doesn't always really have a good, a big effect on revitalizing a language. Um, it's not, it's fine for French because French is not a dying language. It doesn't need to be revitalized. But for a language that's really delicate right now, it needs, it needs more than that 30 to 40 minutes a day.